Okay. So now the like intro to language stuff. So this is just gonna give you an overview of like some basic terminology, where are we going, what are we doing, that kind of thing. Um, so I really always like to like start with, other than I'm goofy, um, um, and oh, uh, don't be forget at the end of class, I will show you the sleeping dog. Okay, so the, the goal to staying towards the end of class is you get to see my sleeping puppy who's always in the room with me. Um, and today, one of the reasons why I'm like, well, that's crazy, we actually adopted another dog, and he's super cute, but he seems to be asleep somewhere else. And I'm going to let him be asleep because he's been crazy all day. So you will get to hear about my dogs, and if you hear a bunch of barking, that's what's going on. <laughs> okay. So we'll we'll check out the, uh, the app dog here in a minute. Okay. But I like to start a course with just a little bit of, like, the Think about this for a second, right? So language is such an amazing topic. Like, we are such amazing creatures because we are the only creatures with complex language. So animals have language, right? Uh, hence all the barking <laughs> I got to hear today. Um, but their language is not in a way, in a, is not um, systematically creative like human language is. And so if you ever like stop and think about how complex the system is and how amazing our brains are, um, I don't know, I'm just, it amazes me. This is why I like this field, right? So if I stop and I think about like, what's the last thing I said other than the fact that I'm talking now, right? How did I decide to say that? How did I know how to form the right muscle movements to say that? Um, or um, how did I, excuse me, know how to respond to something someone said to me. Right? And then when we compile writing on top of that, because writing, um, language, language skills are mostly natural. Like most of us can learn to speak and understand a language, you know, barring any uh, cognitive brain defect kind of stuff. Um, but writing and reading are learned skills. Right? Uh, and that compiled with hearing or for people who are um, hearing impaired, deaf, or simply hearing impaired, uh, you know, sign language presents its own uh, unique set of skills. So, like, the complexity of that system working in the brain. So, uh, one week we have a little section on, like, how that, very briefly, <laughs> how some of that works in the brain. Um, and so, I just find that stuff amazing. Okay. Uh, now, if we look at the history of computational linguistics, so my other course, I talk about the history of natural language processing, because the other course is more of a traditional like NLP course. This one to me is more of a, uh, more of a computational course. Right? They overlap a little bit. Um, but if I look at the history of kind of studying language, and a lot of this is from a perspective of cognitive science or cognitive psychology because that's what I am. So if I look at um, the 1900s, we're talking about Galton who was very interested in intelligence, creating intelligence scales, and then Freud, whatever use he is, left um, studying uh, word associations. So how do we know that peanut butter is a thing? Right? Uh, in the 1950s, what we're seeing is some very famous conferences, academic conferences at both Cornell and Dartmouth. These are the start of having machines that can compute language. So there's a very famous conference where they were um, doing machine translation for the first time. Uh, these are also where we're beginning to describe humans as complex computers, which led us to knowing that we could build AI systems, right? So if a human we don't really function like a computer does, but if we make that analogy, then that means we can write computer code that works like people, mostly, sometimes. Okay. Uh, during the 60s, 70s, uh, what we see is this giant debate fight, um, sparring match between Chomsky, who's still around, as the father of modern linguistics, and Skinner, who was a uh, staunch behaviorist, which meant that if 
he couldn't see it, it didn't exist. So arguing against genetics influence on us, whereas Chomsky is much more of a um, nature folk. So it's pretty determined, it's genetic. So this is kind of the nature versus nurture debate, which now if you want to see that argument, you really, um, you might be interested in um, Pinker, Stephen Pinker uh, argues a lot for um, nature versus nurture. And then everybody else got involved. So there's like people who study language who are linguists and they studied the history of language and the change of language. And then there are people who, um, who study like individual influence on language. Those would be psycholinguist people. And then there's sociolinguists who are sort of kind of language and society. And then there's people who kind of take all of that and computer science. And this is where computational linguistics comes in. Right, so it's artificial intelligence and the increase in computing power and thinking about how do I build a computer that can do this language thing, either processing language or like Siri creating language right? or translation or whatever. Okay, so this, this field is heavily influenced by kind of the intersection of computer science, um, linguistics, and cognitive science. Then that begs the question of like, what are we even studying, <laughs> right? What am I even modeling? So language itself, you've never thought about it past, you know, a day where you forgot a word that you needed to know, um, is a set of symbols. That's really useful because then that means we can take these symbols and convert them into an analysis, right? Numbers are a set of symbols. And those symbols come with rules. These are things like grammar and syntax, which are way more important for my other class. Um, we won't study a whole lot of grammar in this course, but those rules are allow us to do predictive analyses. So if you're trying to build a chat box system, there are rules, there are, uh, word order is super important. You have to have certain things in place for it to make sense. And we're specifically going to focus on natural language, so human language. So I think that's the class we renamed it recently, is now human language modeling. Okay. Um, because I could think about artificial languages like R, you know, Python, there's their artificial languages, which are also a set of symbols and rules, but not creative in the way that we are as humans. Um, but we're gonna use a sort of like um, brain studying itself, right? So we're gonna use computer language to study natural language, which I think is kind of a nice meta-analysis, right? Um, so uh, there's this phrase, metacognition is thinking about thinking, so it's the brain is studying itself. Okay. Um, so what is human language? Well, there's, uh, I keep saying that we're creative, so let me get into that a little bit more. Um, there's a really famous sort of feature design list by Hockett. The Wikipedia page for this is actually like, pretty excellent, if you are interested, that was looking at like, okay, what makes us different from animals? And what makes langu our language more unique than the languages we make up, okay, like computer language? Okay. Um, and then there are languages that we have made up literally like Esperanto, okay? <laughs> so what is it that makes it language? Okay. So what's different communication-wise? And so I'm gonna tell you my favorite four, there's about 16 or 20 rules, um, but one of them is that um, symbols are tied to meaning. And I study semantics. That's one of the things I spend most of my time being interested in. It's this idea of meaning and understanding meaning in relation to other words and mapping the mental dictionary. Okay. And so our language systems, those symbols mean things. But that meaning is fairly arbitrary. Okay. This is a rose by any other name with smell of sweet phrase, right? The symbols themselves aren't tied to the meaning. And it's kind of a hard thing to think about, but it's not like the letters dog actually represent, it's not a picture of a dog or anything, it's just the word, right? That's why we can have those words be different in different languages, and that's why some languages can use this Latin-based system that we have, and other languages, Arabic or Chinese, which, whichever form you want, um, are totally different, right? The symbols are themselves arbitrary. So the sound is arbitrary and the written system. 
they're discrete. This is a big one. So the symbols themselves are composites. So we have a set a system that allows us to recombine our symbols to mean different things. And this is kind of like verb conjugation or adding plurals, indicating past tense, a couple other things. So um, morphemes are the smallest unit of meaning. So if I said I have, you know, yesterday I had dog, one. <laughs> Today I have dogs, two. That S there is a Q that is a, a discrete symbol that is separate from the, the main semantic symbol. And then um, the, the, big, the other big two um, is productivity. Sometimes it's called creativity. And what that means is that we can say things. I've given this lecture a bunch of times. And every time I do it differently. Okay, so you can create a sentence that no one has ever heard before. Um, so users can create and understand novel text. And this is really where it sets um, apart from computer language. Right? You can't just make something up. <laughs> uh, as we all well know, it doesn't run, right? Um, and then animals are not creative in their use of language. Sometimes people tie this to humor, but I don't think, you know, it doesn't have to be, but humor in itself is a way of bending language, creating it, cre using creativity to make people laugh. Okay, so, so what are some of the parts here? Well, practically, there are a lot of biological pieces that have to be in the right place for um, language to work. Can you see this often when things break down? So there are areas of our brain that help control language, like Broca's area here in the front that helps you think about what you're going to say. It's planning, um, attention processing, that kind of stuff. Then there's Wernicke's area here in the back that is um, understanding speech that's coming in. If you have a stroke in one of those areas, your language system is impaired. You have to have um, there's a a genetic a marker, a protein, I think it's a protein called FOXP2 that's also very important and that's a newer discovery on the language system, but literally also have to have the right configuration of the larynx and the tongue. But that's not it. That's not all of it, <laughs> right? You have the right biology. We also have to have the cognitive processing. This is intelligence, right? We have to have a system that processes symbols. And we do. And computers are a system that also processes symbols, but we have to understand the rules for those symbols, like things like word order are very important. Then there's all of our social skills. So knowing um, what do the uh, what does the listener under need to understand that I can communicate. There are social rules and attitudes and lots of cues. So this is um, sometimes called pragmatics, and it's knowing when to use what. So don't curse in church kind of thing. <laughs> um, or in just general, like the way you talk to your boss is very different than the way you talk to your friends. Okay, that kind of stuff. Um, and so there's, there's more here, but these are kind of, the, to me, the big components that we have to try to understand when we model. Right? So many models use are trying to predict the social scenarios or they're trying to leverage our understanding of the cognitive system and then when we get to the end of the semester and we talk about neural net models that is a based on the biological system so every analysis that we're going to look at is kind of picks up on one of these okay. now this is easy right it's communication the purpose of language like why do we have it and it's sort of like a weird time to be asking existential questions but this is the question like why do we have this system? Well, easy enough. Humans are social animals. We like to communicate. I think we've all kind of seen this trapped in our houses, right? Um, but also emotional expression. So um, body language gets counted in this. Yeah, I told you guys I'm a frantic hand waver. I've noticed I'm doing it a lot tonight. But um, uh, also uh, just you know, venting. So I have some friends and we're all in the same Slack channel and we just have this like <laughs> epic thousand page rant going of just daily life frustrations, right? So emotional expression, 
social interaction, which could be separate from communication, right? So communication could be very fact-based. I wrote an article, blog post on the web versus interaction where I expect pieces to come back to me. And then there's thinking. So I think this is an underrated purpose of language. It's very difficult to separate yourself, um, to separate the symbols, the thinking, from the actual process of thinking, the neural process, but we do a lot of thinking. Uh, and that does not require any of the above. But it might. It might have pieces of this. But in general, thinking is kind of separate. Uh, so what can we do to study this? So I could be a linguist, right, who studies the language itself, the history of the language, the changing in syntax, the word usage. I could do psycholinguistics, which is, I guess, kind of where I originally started in, in my path, um, or cognitive linguistics sometimes is what it's called, and it's understanding language and the person. So if I'm interested in... Um, uh, verb choice. Okay. I could do straight linguistics or I could understand how different parts of the world pick different verbs because it's tied to culture. Okay. Uh, there's also sociolinguistics. A lot of sociolinguistics people look at like kind of groups in interaction. So one of my favorite sociolinguistics people is Deborah Tannen and William LaBeouf. And Deborah Tannen's written several very fun, easy to read books about, you know, men and women just talk differently and work moms and daughters and work life whatever so her books are cheap on Amazon if you like that kind of thing and then there's computational linguistics which is what we're going to do which is the analysis of language through computer science okay which just basically the computation part means that there's coding involved neither of these necessarily require coding and I feel like there's so many names. So like people talk about text analytics. They want somebody who's good at text analytics. And I'm like, well, I do computational linguistics. So like, well, it's totally different. I'm like, nope, 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 <laughs> no, it's not. You're, you're actually talking about a very narrow view of computational linguistics, right? So um, I think text analytics has this nice catchphrase to it, but it really misses the fact that there's more to language than just written words. Um, but uh, what's another one? Natural language processing. So there's lots of names for these basic concepts. So anything we're going to kind of call us computational linguistics, meaning anything that we can compute with language. Okay, and that catches a lot of fields. Uh, and the focus here really is on semantics, use, processing, and then my favorite is the last one. So um, we're going to look at analyses that allow us to understand meaning, right? How do people interpret meaning? What words are synonyms? How are words related to each other? So I can leverage that fact to make my writing more interesting. Like, how does Grammarly work? Uh, the use of language. So how do people change how they speak based on the scenario? Right? And so there's a lot of talk about um, stylistics. So you can tell that this wasn't Shakespeare or is Shakespeare because of the way it's written. Um, what cognitive functions are used in interpreting language and how can we use that to our advantage in um, an analytics scenario? And then kind of for fun is this idea of language and reality. Right? So how does the language I speak influence my understanding of reality and vice versa? Um, so we'll talk a lot about slang, dialect, these sort of cultural markers that um, influence how we use and speak our language, uh, which can then again be used in a way to capture the right audience. And so um, my husband and I joke about this a lot. We're both from the Deep South. And so the, uh, I had to call somebody the other day to do a reference check and they were from Mississippi, and it was like being at home. <laughs> I'm from Texas, he's from Mississippi, but I was just like, can you just keep talking? It's so glorious, right? And a lot of people feel this way about the Northeast. There's this very distinct accent that makes you feel like, ah, oh, these are my people. Um, and then there's other research that focuses on acquisition. This is more like developmental. This is the kind of stuff that they teach people who are gonna be teachers or teaching children. 
you know, grammar and that kind of stuff, um, where you are acquiring your first language almost. And it's interesting because if we understand uh, language, um, how people acquire language, we can actually write programs to do it too. And I would say we'll have a section where we'll talk about Google's machine translation and how cool that thing is and how that has really pushed the limits of what deep learning can do. And this is where the Skinner versus Chomsky debate comes in. Um, the argument is, are we a tabula rasa, which is a famous phrase meaning a blank slate when we're born, that everything is experience, or are we genetically predisposed to things? Okay, they're both right. Okay. A lot of it's due to experience, a lot of it is genetic because of what we know about biology, um, but people love to argue about this stuff. All right. <clears throat> So some highlights of some things we'll hit. We'll talk a little bit about phonetics and um, phonemes. And these are people who study the sounds, okay? Accent, tone, emphasis. Right? If you've ever seen My Fair Lady, like they're teaching her to speak correctly, that's the kind of idea. So the phonemes are the smallest unit of sound. That is very important if you're ever interested in speech synthesis and having systems, dialogue systems that talk like Siri. Uh, so if it's useful in text-to-speech processing and the other ways where people, I um, um, like read aloud systems, but also like things like Dragon where I talk to it and it types it out. Okay. Syllables are our emphasis systems. Okay, different languages have different syllables. Okay. Then I might study syntax, which is the combination of words. So if I'm writing a, um, an AI model that uh, is a chat box or a help desk automated system? How do I get it to talk back in a way that people understand? Semantics, again, back to meaning, metaphors, analogies. So semantics is a very broad field. I study like this little piece of it, but um, these are people who, fo who could focus on like what do documents mean and how do we um, classify those kinds of documents quickly? something an analytics person might do. And I could focus on lexical semantics, which is about the syntax, the way it's put together for meaning, or compositional compositional semantics, um, which is more about phrase and sentence structure. And then morphology, which is a study of the, of the morphemes, the units of, of, of meaning in a word, and I uh, recently watched like the father of morphology basically get up and say morphemes are not a thing and I think my brain just like exploded and I haven't really recovered <laughs> but this idea of like conjugations and why is English such a stupid language English is a dumb language okay the joke is that it's three different languages in a trench coat pretending to be an older adult right it is um it has some weird moments and if you're a second language speaker I think you I've had these moments of like, why is English like this? Um, so studying morphemes is one thing that you could maybe answer that question. Okay. Um, we could study the lexicon itself. Okay, this is a study of the properties of the word. We'll do a section on WordNet and look at um, the, the dictionary, English dictionary, so to speak. Okay. Or And then a lot of, we'll do a bunch of stuff on pragmatics. How do we pick the right word for the right scenario? Discourse is studies of large chunks. So at the end of the semester, when we get into topics modeling, LSA, and word to vec we're really going to be talking about, like, how do I study language in these huge chunks? I have all these text documents. How do I summarize them? And then uh, one thing we t kind of will do a little bit of is stylistics, where we look at how do different cultural cues lead to different word choices. So I have a, a section for logistic regression on do versus let in Dutch. So um, which one do people pick and why? All right, what do we add? So let me see. I guess we don't have to finish this all tonight. Do, do, do. Basic areas. Do, 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 do. So let's get through just a couple more slides and I'll leave some time at the end for questions. Um, so we'll go right up 
I'm sitting and we'll just finish this little bit of notes we have left next week. Okay. All right, so some basic language terminology. So what are words? Right. They're nouns, the big four, adjectives, which modify nouns, verbs, which are the action words, and adverbs, which modify verbs. Okay, I'm going to call these the big four all semester. They are the content pieces. They tell us what um, is happening in text. And generally, most people are very interested in these because let's say you're doing a topics analysis or um, you're trying to predict word choice. These are the ones you're trying to be in, you're interested in. But there are other ones like determinants, the and a, Pro pronouns, you, we, he, she, it. There's a famous book called The Secret Life of Pronouns by Pennebaker that's really good that talks about pronoun use. Prepositions of, into, upon, between, conjunctions, and, but, and more. Oh, sorry. I thought I had an and more here. And more. Um, we're mostly going to focus on nouns, adjectives, verbs, and adverbs. <clears throat> we could also think about phrasal units. Okay, so I have an example from one of my other classes. But phrases are kind of a, a grammatical unit of words. And we'll slowly work our way up at the end of the semester to doing discourse, which is the whole text itself. Okay. But noun phrases are words where the focus is the, the noun, so the angry bear here. Verb phrases are groups of words where the verb is the interesting piece. And so we'll have some analyses where we look at um, how word choice happens within those phrasal units. Okay, and we can also do preposition phrases. Okay, and those are modifiers. Modifiers are super interesting because um, these are usually descriptions, and so that can be really useful for writing maybe text descriptions for your product online to better um, to sell more units, that kind of thing. Or we can make these cute tree diagrams. Now, the tree diagram stuff is more in the other class, but we could. All right. So at the end of the semester, you will be able to make your own semantic network. So you can build, you'll be able to build a semantic network model or create some cool pictures of the relationship between words. And then you can look at one of my favorite websites, the small world of words. We're going to look at my favorite word, which is cheese. And so we'll be able to build these network models. So these are all what are called a one hop network, words that are all um, related to cheese by association, meaning if I said cheese, what's the first word that comes to mind? Holes, which is something like Swiss cheese. Where's Swiss? Swiss should be on here. I don't see it. Cakes milk. Um, so we got our like milk over here. We've got color and then smile. Mm. Um, oh, cheese like pictures, smile, yeah, uh, kind of mouse, mice over here, some more other types of food over here, and uh, small world of words is actually in languages other than English, but I think most of their visualizations are in English, maybe not, maybe it's just the one I've gotten to, if you click home, you can learn more about the project, and you can actually participate um, and add your own words to it in these different languages. Or play around in the lexicon. So let's see here. Let's do one more visualization because this stuff is so much fun. Um, settings, there it goes. Let's look at a 3D network because these are pretty cool. This time of dog. And so the cool thing about the 3D pictures is that you can turn them in 3D, right? So you can see what words are more Related or less related. So the distance here is the relationship. Cool. All right. Oop. Ah. You were through this one. Yada yada yada. Small world of words, right? And these models focus on um, meaning rather than grammar. So Swiss here should be connected to holes. Yeah, I think what it is is that if um, here, let's go back. Back to your question. When you look up cheese, the instructions in this experiment are um, given this word, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Okay, so you get some of this 
grilled cheese, but mostly it tends to be mice and mouse food because it's a type of food. If I looked up Swiss as a word, then you'll see cheese. Because if I say Swiss first, the very next thing at least comes to my mind is cheese. And so those three are kind of interconnected through each other. Um, I think that answers your question. Got it. Okay. Good. All right. And let's see here. So let's take this one, our last one, and we'll start with corpora next time. That's a really great kind of, well, actually, I lied to you. Let's get through this one at corpora, and then we'll cut. Uh, whoops. Okay. So these kinds of models are built on two types of things. They're either built on propositional logic, which is like um, meant to be sort of yes, no. This is how WordNet is built, where a dog is a tree. That's false. I know that's false. A dog is an animal. Or it can be built on what's called first order logic, so relationships between each other. So um, your question about Swiss here, um, Swiss is a type of cheese, right? And it has holes, so that's a function or a property of that. Okay? And these are sometimes called ontologies. And so in a couple weeks, we'll do some work on categories and we'll come back to these topics, ideas. Okay. So let's end tonight's like actual yapping from me on corpora, and we'll save the rest of the notes for next time. And corpora are your friend. Okay, so a corpus is a very large body of text or a lot of very a lot of data on text. And so we can do an amazing amount of things with a corpus. So we're going to have towards the end of the semester use a lot of corpora. At the beginning of the semester more structured data sets but that are built from corpus, a corpus. Okay. So Generally, corpora are used to build part of speech taggers, which are very important for a lot of other tasks. Stimming, limitization, which is where you're breaking down words into their roots. So, um, cheesy becomes cheese. Uh, building grammars, uh, understanding types of words. And what we'll use them for is to help build ourselves models that represent English as a language. Like, here's English. So some very popular corpora is Brown Corpus. It's the most overused corpus, in my opinion. It was published in a book in the 1960s, and it has texts in a couple of categories, like science fiction and hobbies. It's a very popular corpus for teaching people how to do part of speech tagging, which is what it was used for for a long time. It's very handy, but is old at this point. Uh, the LOB Corpus is the British answer to the Brown Corpus because we have a ton of data on the differences between American and British English, even though we're speaking the same language. Um, a child's database, which is about children's speech. Okay, I don't know how different that is than adult speech. WordNet, I've talked about a couple times, is an online structured dictionary, and that structure is useful for understanding similarity. TreeBank is a different form of WordNet that um, is really used for understanding root words or part of speech tagging. Uh, so if you are ever trying to disambiguate a word choice, TreeBank or WordNet is usually how that's done. So it figures out what definition that should be. Reuters Corpus is a corpus of news articles that is very popular for machine learning. ANC and BNC are the American and British National Corpus. COCA we'll use a couple of times, which is the Corpus of Contemporary American English. It's all online. You can search it. And then Google's Ngrams, which is a very cool corpus that we will use a little bit. Okay. And more. Okay, so web, chat, email, tweets. These are many of the new corpora um, that Kaggle has. So Kaggle has a lot of them, like Amazon, Yelp, Twitter, sentiment data sets. Um, product reviews, yada, yada, yada. There's a ton of stuff available, especially now that the internet allows us to kind of collect this data and put it in one place. Actually, Harvard, just the other day, like two days ago, I think, um, released a political speeches corpus that is one of the largest to date. And so finishing out from last week, one thing that I want you to get out of this course, which I think is probably obvious to a lot of analytics folks, 
is that we can take language and convert it into some form of statistical analysis. And for a lot of people, that's like, what? We can make words into numbers, basically. Um, and so originally, you know, kind of in research, a lot of people thought like, well, studying language is a qualitative skill set, meaning that it is, you know, you read it and you maybe make, do a thematic, what's called a thematic analysis, where you hand code everything, or it's sort of interpretive dance. And so people who studied this sort of language ha did work in this, like grammar and syntax, that kind of stuff, um, did this qualitatively instead of computationally. And the statistics were simple percentages or means, but um, not so much now. So for a long time, language, language has been considered innate. I mean, it still is considered primarily, primarily a lot of innate pieces. So there are biological components we talked about last week, um, but it does require experience. And so if it is partially genetic, that means we have all have pretty much the same underlying system. And that means we just got to figure out what that system is. And clearly we've made great strides in this area. Otherwise, we wouldn't have things like Watson or Siri. Now, AI is not like you see in the movies, right? Um, so I have a colleague who does uh, linguistic research a lot similar to kind of what I do. He wrote some of these models that we've talked about. And he's like, you know, if I could just get it to understand a sentence sometimes, I think we would be further along than we've ever been. So, um, you know, I think we're doing better at building these complex systems, but we are nowhere close to what people can do. Um, however, kind of going back to this qualitative to quantitative idea, we know that humans are statistical language learners. So one of the articles included for last week that covers the section is about how humans are intuitive statisticians. So we learn the physical words um, and you know you learn how to read and stuff by, by simple experience. Okay. So our interaction with our environment cannot be ignored. And so there's a, a couple of theories about how the language that you speak influences the, your perception of the world which is um, sometimes called Warfian or sapier warfian hypothesis. And while we don't believe it determines the way that you see the world, um, there is some good support that it influences our perceptions of the world, these different words. Mm -hmm. And so language knowledge is shaped by language use, which means if we're intuitive statisticians, that clearly means that we can take language and analyze it with statistics. Okay. So, Anyone who's like, well, that's a soft skill set, doesn't know what they're talking about, right? Um, so we can do a lot of statistics on language, and that's what we're going to spend the whole semester doing, is learning how to deal with categorical data and continuous data um, and linguistics. Okay. And so what influences um, a lot of these results? Well, if the one thing you remember from this semester is that word frequency is the, one of the biggest predictors of stuff. So it predicts most of the psychological data that we see. It will predict how people read, all this stuff. Um, it's word frequency. Okay. Words that are more frequent are easier to read, easier to process. Words that are less frequent are interesting and sometimes more difficult to process. I mean, it's a big deal, frequency. But our cognitive mechanisms can also influence the way that we perceive and process language. So there is a statistical structure to our um, understanding of linguistic knowledge. So categories, we'll talk about categories kind of off and on all semester. And what those are is just groupings of words that are, are linked in some way. Maybe they're very similar, they're part of the same hierarchical structure, they share some share, set of shared features, so animals would be a category, plants, that kind of thing. And they have very um, clearly probabilistic um, structures to them. We'll talk about how to look at that. Uh, there are plenty of social mechanisms that influence language, so it's just the representation of word meaning. 
So how can we tell the words um, meaning and implication has changed over time? Well, we could use word frequency and its surroundings. Uh, so uh, looking at the word tweet, right? 200 years ago, that's all about birds. Now it's all about social media. There are plenty of new words in your lifetime, so if you're, if you're interested in analyzing slang, you know, it's a little harder because the data sets, by the time that you have a data set that you can measure um, new memes and that kind of stuff, it's already old. <laughs> so keeping up with slang is difficult. Okay. There's slang there. So let me give you some examples. What I might try to do is model word choice, and we'll do that in a couple weeks when we talk about logistic regression, picking which word someone might use. I could take very large corpora and analyze the data, which we'll do several times this semester. Could create be what are called behavioral profiles. We'll do that in a couple weeks. And this is essentially kind of like a cluster analysis on words themselves. And you create these kind of um, groupings that words that act the same way. We'll have a big section on semantic vector space models. This is at least three weeks, four, kind of five if you include word to vec as one of these, like the whole end, the last month of the class so on semantic vector space models because I think that's really where a lot of this stuff gets really um, in continuous data land, gets really cool. And then we could also use traditional statistics like t-tests, ANOVA, correlation regression. Okay. So while I am an academic, I do a lot of this work, I have used almost all of these, right? including many, many regressions. <laughs> I'm over regression right now, but like that, it's not like I, um, as a person who's also trained in statistics, have don't ever use traditional statistics when uh, analyzing language. So let me give you a simple example. So Berlin and Kay proposed this idea about linguistic interpretation of color. And uh, the series kind of focused on this idea that um, there's this hierarchy to learning colors and the way that they sort of permeate through language. And so you should see differences in different types of registers or different types of text and their usage of these words based on how sort of advanced they are. Okay, so pretty much every text, spoken language, whatever, should always start with kind of black and white words. Okay, literally the words black and white here. Um, then move into red, green and yellow, brown. And so it ends up being the more like fancy color words, magenta, maroon, right? But we always start with white and black. And so there's these kind of like universal color categories and the order in which one would expect to see them in as a language either grows or a, a type of text, which is called a register, um, becomes more uh, advanced. Right? So news, it would be a register. And so we could take some data from the Corpus of Contemporary American English, or COCA, and just see if there are differences in word frequency uh, over different registers. Okay. So what the, the Arling library here, which is not available in CRAN, and you'll see in your um, installation guide how to install that, uh, has a data set called ColReg for color register. It's got four of the uh, types of registers. So these are just categories of text. So spoken text, fiction, academic, and press. There's clearly are different types of things. So we might expect to see different usages of these color red colors based on this theory, right? Whoops, sorry, I hit my mouse here. Um, and what is in the data here, these numbers are raw frequency caps. Now, raw frequency counts always sort of present a problem when we're analyzing text because what we'll see is that some of these uh, data sets are just larger than others. Okay. So the press data set is just clearly a bigger data set than the academic data set. Okay, so that's the problem is, is with corpus size here. 
So the first thing we got to do is control for the fact that some of the, these are different numbers of words just in general. And so I know what the corpus size is for COCA, and that's the numbers that I found online for their different um, registers, academic, spoken, I forgot already, uh, spoken fiction, academic, and press. So they're different sizes, clearly. You can tell this one's much bigger. And we can actually calculate what's called the deviation for proportion. Um, and so normally what we calculate is like a standard deviation, right? You have the mean, you have all these different um, participants, and you can calculate the spread around the mean. Well, you know, this is a proportion. How many times is black mentioned out of the total number of words in that data set? And I can't just, like, there's the there's not a bunch of numbers here. I can't just calculate a standard deviation on that. So we're going to use um, this uh, proportion of from for a deviation. I'm sorry, a deviation or like a standard deviation, a variance expected for a proportion. Okay. And the way we do that is this fancy code here from the textbook. Okay, so it calculates the um, observed counts, the physical counts from the data, minus the expected counts. Um, absolute valued so that we get this in, um, we don't have, um, it doesn't sum to zero. Okay. And we sum up their absolute value. So this is very similar to standard deviation because it's X minus the mean, right? But because we don't want to deal with, um, you know, if we summed all that up, it would total to zero. We square it normally. Well, in this formula, instead of squaring it, we take the absolute value. Um, two seconds on your question. It's a great question. I'm going to get there. And then we divide by two. Hey, why two? I don't remember, actually. <laughs> but it's part of the formula to divide by two. So then the deviation is this um, deviation value divided by the sort of minimum of the expected count. And so what this represents is kind of a var expected variance that we might see in these data sets. So scores close to zero indicate that across these different, um, I haven't forgotten your question, uh, across these different registers, it's relatively equal spread. So really the question we're asking here is almost chi-square, which we'll cover later, is if I look at the expected values or the, the total, the total uh, number of words here and calculate the Proportion for each of these categories, are those proportions roughly equal, so the variance is not very big, or are the proportions very different, so there's a lot of variance. So we're really just calculating by row kind of a variance measure. And remember the variance is spread around the middle, and so scores close to zero indicate that the, the frequencies are relatively equal given corpus size. There's no real variance between them. Values closer to one, because this is a bounded statistic, um, indicate that there is a big spread in the data, that one of the categories is more strongly favored than the other, so the data is kind of shifted to one or another. Okay. And the theory appears to be supported. So let me go back to your question here. How do we come up with the expected values? Um, what we have here is the actual um, frequency in the data. So maybe expected count is not the best phrase here. Maybe it should be total frequency is actually what we're putting in there. Does that answer your question? Yep, great. So this here is the total frequency. So I wrote the function here, and then you can see we put in frequency reg. Right, which is the um, total word count. <clears throat> All right. So for theory being supported, let me explain that. What we see is if we calculate just for black, right, is the spread of the use of the word black, is it the same in each of these registers? Essentially, are those proportions uh, varied or are they all roughly the same? Uh, and what we would expect, given color theory, let me back up, 
is that they should be roughly the same because this should be the first set of colors that enter a register. So everyone should be using these pretty equally across register. And then if we go to a word that's um, a later color word, one register might prefer those over another, meaning that that type of text is more advanced, so to speak. Right, and so what we see for black is that they're all fairly equal. That score is closer to zero than what we see for gray, where there's a greater spread where one category is favored over another. If these two things were roughly the same, that would imply that every word is used equally across registers, which would not support color theory. And so we'll come back to color theory and, and use this, this data set again, but this is just a very simple statistic. Can we see if the proportion of words is roughly equal across uh, different types of text? Okay. And that would tell you something about the way the text were written. So this semester, although this feels a little weird to do it week two, but we're going to learn both R and Python. Okay, we're going to mix and match. We're going to start tonight by talking about categorical data. Okay, how do I deal with frequency counts? How do I deal with making clusters? So we're going to do conditional inference trees, um, cluster analysis, something else. I see. I'm looking at my calendar and I forgot to write it down. But we're going to do some categorical stuff, log regression. Then we'll switch to continuous types of, of data using uh, linear regression and factor analysis. Then we're going to do some higher order modeling techniques using vector space models, word to vec, and information theory, making some network models. Okay. We're going to end with a little bit on deep learning. So each week we're going to detail kind of a language topic. Uh, beginning of the semester focuses more on categories. Because it gives you a little bit of the like research background, like why are people interested in this and how might this apply to analy uh, analytics? And then we'll look at how to perform an analysis in that particular area.